mode. Hello, and welcome to the Facial Paralysis and Bell's Palsy Foundation presents Is Botox a Viable Treatment Option for Facial Paralysis? With Dr. Babak Aziza Day. I'm Lisa McKinley, Director of our Foundation, and I'm being assisted today by Barbara Pasternacki, our Pacific Northwest Work Group Leader. Our presentation today will take approximately 40 minutes, and then we will take questions from attendees. You may type your questions at any time in the box on the control panel on the right side of your screen, and Dr. Zizadeh will answer them at the end of the presentation as time allows. I would now like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Babak today is the president and founder of our foundation and the director of the Facial Paralysis Institute in Beverly Hills, California. He is a graduate of UCLA Medical School and a former clinical fellow at the Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. today We're looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you so much, Lisa. I want to, uh, first of all, thank Lisa and Barbara for organizing this uh, event. Uh, webinars are really, really important for the foundation, I think, for our outreach, giving more education to um, individuals uh, or family members of patients uh, who have facial nerve disorders. And hopefully today I'll be able to give some uh, information about uh, uh, how we use Botox and other treatment modalities in facial paralysis and synkinesis. So what are the goals of facial reanimation? Uh, basically, the most important thing that patients come in to see us for is to restore a normal or near normal smile mechanism. Uh, patients also want to improve functional issues such as if they're biting their lip tightness in the neck, drooling, create symmetry of their face, correct eye closure. For some people, their eyes are too wide. For some people, their eyes are too narrow. We'll go over why we see that. We want to reduce people who are self-conscious, and we want to enhance self-confidence. Facial nerve function, obviously we know the facial nerve is a muscle, uh, uh, innervates the muscles of facial expression, but they also give taste fibers to the tongue, as well as give signals to our salivary glands to produce saliva and to our tear glands to produce tears. The anatomy is very complex and intricate. The signals start in the brain. They travel outside as they exit the brain in a very circuitous route through a bone behind the ear called the temporal bone. And this is where a lot of pathology, such as Bell's palsy and so forth, occurs. As they exit this bone, they divide into multiple branches. We really consider five major branches, the frontal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal mandibular, and cervical branches. However, there is actually extensive cross-connections between the nerves, between the lower and upper division. Now we divide up the muscles of activity, the muscles that they're innervating into three zones. The eye zone, and here you see the frontalis muscle, the orbicularis oculi, which helps close the eye, the frontalis elevates the eyebrow. We have the corrugator that allows us to frown and gives us that 11 sign. In the smile zone, the zygomatic major muscle is the major smile muscle, but we also have the zygomatic minor, levator labii superioris, and levator labii superioris aliquai nasi. We also have the buccinator that's abutting the smile and frown zone, which is this deep muscle. And then the frowning zone has extensive, very large muscles, the depressor anguli oris, the isma, the rhizorius, and these are all interconnected and they converge right at the corner of the mouth. And that's why it's a very intricate system of how we smile and how we frown. 
what are the causes of facial paralysis? And I won't go into significant detail. You can refer to the prior webinars that we've had, but Bell's palsy is the most common cause of facial paralysis. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, trauma, acoustic neuroma, surgery, ear and parotid surgery, other types of facelift surgeries can potentially lead to paralysis if it's not done by an experienced surgeon. People can be born with it, stroke, hemifacial microsomia, middle ear infection, and Lyme disease, the most common cause of bilateral facial paralysis. Congenital facial paralysis, Mobius syndrome, is the most common cause of bilateral facial paralysis. I want to briefly talk about Bell's palsy because it is very common. So we, with Bell's palsy, this is actually the most common cause of facial paralysis. It affects 40,000 people in the U.S. every year. One in 65 will be affected during their lifetime. So it's a pretty, I would say, significant medical issue in our society. The, the issues, the way that Bell's palsy comes about is a herpes a simplex virus that causes cold sore can go and basically lay dormant in the facial nerve. It lays dormant right here near the geniculate ganglion right in that bone that we talked about. And then for a variety of reasons, it can get reactivated. And essentially, when it gets reactivated, it gets swollen, and that swelling reduces blood supply to the nerve, and it's as if the nerve has been cut. And most people regain 85% of patients. It's a minor issue. They regain complete recovery. But 15% may develop synkinesis and dysfunction of their smile. We'll talk about why. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is very similar to Bell's palsy, but it's caused by a chicken pox virus called varicella. Individuals have much more severe issues when they have Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. They get a blisters and rash in the ear, they can get hearing loss and dizziness, and the recovery is not as good in patients with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Acoustic neuroma on itself is not the most common cause of facial paralysis. However, when acoustic neuromas are being removed, there's a risk to developing facial paralysis. Acoustic neuromas are benign brain tumors that's involving an area called the cerebellopontine angle where our hearing, balance, and facial nerves pass through. They account for about 80% of the tumors, and as you can see, the tumor itself grows very slowly. It doesn't cause paralysis for the majority of patients, but it stretches the nerve. So when this tumor is being removed, the nerve can either get less blood supply or get some sort of inflammation, or can get damaged at that time. Because the nerve architecture is very complex. This is a single facial nerve example. And as you could see, within the facial nerve, there are bundles and bundles of branches, which we call axons. It's similar to a fiber optic cable. So each of these little nerve fibers are destined to go to a different area of the face. Some will go to the lower face, the grimacing zone, some will go to the smiling zone, some will go to the eye zone. Now what happens in nerve injury when we sew things up, this is not how we can sew it. We don't sew them one fascicle at a time and the nerve doesn't regenerate one fascicle at a time. What happens is that the external area is brought together and guess what? These little internal zones can then crisscross and go to different areas. And that's why almost any form of nerve repair or regeneration can lead to what we call aberrant regeneration. That means the nerves are not going to where they were supposed to go, or they're going to where they're supposed to go and other places as well. So what this does, it creates an uncoordinated and simultaneous movement of the face, which we call synkinesis. So in this example, the red fiber, instead of the red fiber going to the eye area, the red fiber goes to the eye area, to the mid-face area, and to the lower face area. So what happens is that when someone tries to smile, even though the nerves have completely regenerated, 
the actions of these frowning muscles overcome the actions of the smiling muscles. So instead of the corner of the mouth going up like a normal smile, it comes down. So this is an example of an, a gentleman who had trauma and developed a complete right facial paralysis. And we did a great operation, what's called a hypoglossal facial nerve. So we sewed in the hypoglossal nerve into his facial nerve to give him nerve input. And as you can see, he's had an excellent outcome. However, the left side, which is the normal side, is going upwards while the right side comes down. So, this brings us to understanding the types of paralysis. So anyone who has the nerve, their nerve severely damaged or severed and it's re-sewn or regenerated will develop what we call synchinesis or partial paralysis. Someone whose nerve is cut or severed or completely and permanently uh, uh, damaged will develop a complete paralysis. And these two types of paralysis are very, very, very different. Someone with a complete paralysis has no movement, their brows are depressed, their eyes can't close, the lower eyelid is uh, lax, their whole face is flaccid and falling, they have no laugh line, the corner of the mouth is coming down, they have no ability to elevate the lower lip as it's commonly done or bring down the lower lip as it's commonly done. Whereas on the normal side, you see they have a normal smile, you see teeth, and the teeth shows a significant issue between uh, for a patient with complete paralysis. Now, someone with synkinesis has a completely different, because they actually have too much tone. They're getting so much nerve input because every time they're trying to blink their eyes, their face is moving. Every time they're trying to move their face, their eyes closing. So they have this simultaneous and uncoordinated elevator and frowning activity leading to the corner of the mouth coming down. You see less teeth show on both the upper and lower area. Instead of the eye being wide open, it's actually too narrow when they try to smile. And you see the dimpling in their chin because that muscle is constantly getting activated. And the muscle that we call platysma is hyperactivated. And in fact, sometimes instead of getting their brows come down, it goes up. This is an example of someone with really, really narrow eyes with smiling that we can see in synchinesis. And this is the same example of the teeth show is completely different between the two sides. The corner of the mouth is coming down. You see dimpling, you see banding in the neck. So I'm not going to get into a significant discussion about evaluation and treatment. We did that in our last webinar. Feel free to go and visit that last webinar that we talked about. But again, there are two different factors. Immediate treatment, someone who comes in with a fresh facial paralysis, and long-standing. We don't really use Botox for patients who have immediate onset paralysis, with a few exceptions. And I'll show you one exception of that. But for the most part, patients who have had long-standing paralysis, who we know what the cause was, that's when we start thinking about treatment. So when someone comes in who's had long-standing facial paralysis, we still want to make sure that they don't have any evidence of a tumor or some sort of malignancy causing their paralysis. So if someone comes in like this lady saying, oh yeah, you know, I, I got Bell's palsy 12 months ago, this is not Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is going to look more like this, someone who has some tone back, someone who has complete flaccid, complete paralysis after two to three months of getting paralysis does not have Bell's palsy, so they need to be really evaluated for other causes, such as tumors and malignancies and trauma. So it's really, really important. Now, if the if patients come in at 12 months, they have complete paralysis, they're going to be treated differently than someone who has partial paralysis with synchinesis. Someone who has a complete paralysis typically and almost always will get treatment surgically with advanced nerve procedures and muscle transfers, which we're not going to really go into deeply, but they are not going to, at that time, be really candidates for Botox or 
therapy or neuromuscular retraining, they need to address their paralysis with surgery immediately. And this is a lady who had a combination treatment. She had acoustic neuroma with complete paralysis. And we did a masseteric facial nerve transfer, a cross-face nerve graft, and a gracilis free flap to get her smile back. We also used some fillers and Botox to even her face at a later time. Now, patient who presents with synkinesis, someone who's had maybe Bell's palsy, who didn't completely recover, someone who had maybe a nerve graft, their nerve was cut, someone may have had acoustic neuroma that got some recovery, someone who had a parotid tumor or temporal bone trauma. This is the typical presentation 12 months, 10 months, two years later. And there's no time commitment. Anytime after a year, whether it's 10, 15, 20 years later, the same exact treatment algorithm can work. So we typically treat patients with multiple modalities. Just like everything else, unfortunately, there's no one perfect treatment. But when we combine our treatments, and we'll go through all of them, patients can get an outstanding outcome. So we combine neuromuscular retraining with physical therapy, neuromodulators like Botox, fillers, and surgery to address patients with this type of outcome. And that's how patients get the best possible outcome. Why do we use neuromuscular retraining? Number one, the brain needs to be retrained about their new smile. It's not the old smile, it's a new smile. So they need to be to understand that they're not smiling. They, someone like this already has a lot of contraction. It's hyperactive. So they have to actually be able to learn how to relax and be able to coordinate their smile better. It's not more power, but it's more finesse to their smile. Furthermore, neuromuscular retraining, we get so much contraction of our cheeks and neck and around the nose that we need to stretch those areas and give those areas more length because the muscle is so tight that it can't contra contract very well. So we do that to the zygomatic major muscle, to the platysma, which is this big muscle that goes down to the neck, to the buccinator muscle, which is a muscle just inside our mouth. So neuromuscular retraining and rehab is really important. Now, what is Botox? The neuro, we call them neuromodulators because they're modulating, they're changing and affecting the way that the muscles move. So how do they work and why do we use it? Botox is the most common neuromodulator that we use, and we'll explain to you why they're important. And essentially what Botox does is it relaxes and reduces certain muscle activities. So in our neck area, where it's really contracted for that patient who has partial paralysis and synkinesis, Botox will relax that muscle and reduce its activity. For the area around the eye, where it's really, really, really hyperactive, same thing. It aids our neuromuscular retraining. For the buccinator, for areas around the forehead and glabella. So essentially what it does, Botox is a protein that goes right at the junction of where the nerve and muscle meet and reduces the activity of that muscle in that area. It doesn't completely get rid of it, it just reduces it temporarily. There are several types and serotypes of Botox. Uh, type A, botulinum toxin, type A is the most commonly used. Botox was first approved in 1989, so it's been around for a long time and it really has been used probably over about 30 years or so. And in fact, its first application was for blepharospasms, which are kind of a sister um, pathology to synkinesis. So originally its use was for very, very similar issues as synkinesis. Now, Botox is made by Allergan. There are other compounds such as Dysport, ZMN, Puritox, and Riloxin. Now, they all work in a similar fashion. Some will have a, you know, slightly different preparations and uh, disperse. So your practitioner should have expertise, obviously, in facial nerve as well as Botox to be able to do this. 
Now, even though it's technically easy to inject Botox because you go right under the skin, and at the end of the uh, uh, session, I'll show you a, v a video of um, Botox and uh, application, which is very good. We just made that through the foundation. But conceptually, it's very difficult for practitioners who don't have experience in facial nerve disorders because most doctors don't understand synkinesis. Most doctors don't understand facial nerve, Bell's palsy. So that's where, unfortunately, issues come about with patients saying, oh, yeah, I've had Botox, but it didn't work. So unless it's done by a very experienced doctor and also even experienced doctors, like myself, sometimes I have to tweak stuff. Sometimes I have to increase dosing, reduce dosing, go into a new area. So there is, for each patient, we have to come up with a map where it works well. And we'll go through some of that area. Now, Botox typically lasts about three to four months. It's very rare for people to develop antibody or resistance. Typically, we want to minimize the amount of dosage and we don't want to do a lot of touch-ups. We want to really give it three months in between treatment. It's an extremely safe product. I've been using it probably, including my you know, training, about 20 years, and I've never had any major complications. Uh, most of the adverse events are pretty limited and resolve on their own. Uh, you can get sometimes over weakening of targeted muscles. You could get diffusion to other areas. Sometimes you could get the eyelash ptosis. That's a rare, but it can happen. But it resolves usually within a few weeks. You can get asymmetry, uh, dysphagia, dyspnea. These major complications that you've heard of are with large, large, large doses in pediatric patients and injecting hundreds, hundreds of units for people who have torticollis and so forth, and probably by doctors who are probably not very, very well in tune with the product. In the hands of a, um, a, a what I would call kind of an advanced injector, it's an extremely safe product. So where do we inject? What do we do? And why do we do it? So around the eye area, we generally inject to reduce the narrowing of the eye in patients with synkinesis. And it works very, very well. And sometimes we do the opposite side to improve crow's feet. People oftentimes have very hyperactive corrugator muscle, this muscle right here, and we inject that. And sometimes if their right forehead is paralyzed, we'll post the left forehead to give them evenness and to create symmetry of the eyebrow. In the lower mouth, we try to inject areas that are in that frowning zone that we talked about to reduce the downward activity and to uh, reduce the contraction of that area. We oftentimes inject in the neck area, in the platysma, and in the buccinator. So let's go through some examples. This is an individual who has a right synkinesis, right facial paralysis, you see the dimpling, you see her lower lip not being able to be brought down, you see hyperactivity of the corrugators, you see the narrowing of the eyes, and her smile doesn't have good symmetry, and you see the banding here. So these are the areas that we injected. This little injection is really great because it actually weakens the muscle that lowers the normal side of that area. So by doing that, we actually bring the slip up, improving the symmetry of the teeth, which is great. So this is her after photo with improved eye symmetry, improved elevation, dimpling is gone, banding is gone. This is a lady who, again, had a nerve, uh, uh, nerve regeneration, has narrowing of the eyes. As you can see, Botox improved not only the crow's feet on both sides, but the widening of the eye was improved. This is a gentleman who has something we call a congenital unilateral lower lip palsy. We also see this often with patients who have had experience. So as you can see, he actually has a paralysis on the right side because this right lower lip muscle, the depressor labia inferioris, is not moving down, whereas the left is. So we injected a little bit of Botox here and get an excellent symmetry in his smile. And this is a really, really great operation or great procedure. 
This is an individual who you can see has a left-sided synkinesis, narrow eye aperture. Her eyebrows and forehead are pretty good. Her laugh line is deeper on this side. Upper teeth show pretty good. Her smile is fairly good, not perfect, but fairly good. But you can see the lower teeth. There's a discrepancy in the amount of show. You see the dimpling. She has a lot of contraction of the platysma. So we injected Botox in these areas to just improve the narrowing, the tightness in the neck, symmetry of the lower teeth and upper teeth, and improving the upper speed of that area. And you can see that the pre optical smile to the pre-op, her eye narrowing is better, not perfect. Her upper teeth show are improved, dimpling is gone, banding is gone in the neck. So it worked really, really well. She did great. So, Botox does very, very well. I'm going to go back to this. As you can see, it does very, very, very well for patients who have pretty good smiles. It improves tightness in the neck, dimpling, and narrowed eye. But for patients whose smile are not as ideal, unfortunately, Botox alone, in my experience over the past few years, just didn't improve everything that I wanted for these types of patients of partial paralysis. So we started looking at surgical management and how do we really address that smile and improve the corner of the mouth. So we have two options. Number one, to reduce that downward movement because there's so much downward pressure by these large mus muscles that the patients can't smile. Or you can increase the upward movement. So how do we do that? Through a very, very simple procedure called selective neurolysis and neurectomy, what we do is we actually go and map out these little nerve branches that are going to those areas. And what this does, we reduce the activity of these nerves. And what this does, it allows the corner of the mouth to have a better upward traction. And with neuromuscular retraining and stretching exercise, patients do extremely, extremely well. The, Operation also reduces the need for Botox in these areas, so the majority of patients will still need Botox around the eyes on the opposite side, but not as much in the neck, which can take up a lot of Botox. So the patient's outcome are, has been really great in the majority of patients. So this is an individual who has synchinesis on the right side, narrowing of the eye, corner of the mouth down, some tension, and she had a selective neurolysis and as you can see, her teeth show is more even. The corner of the mouth is going up. Laugh lines are very even. Eyes are still very similar to pre-op because that needs to be treated with Botox and the banding of the neck is better. This is another lady who had same thing, right-sided synkinesis, dimpling, downward traction, banding. She had a selective neurolysis with a facelift. And as you can see, she has elevated corner of the mouth, improved teeth show, more symmetry all around. And she also had Botox around the eyes, which improved her eye aperture. Smile. And as you can see, there is um, the video, the corner of the mouth is much better, the teeth and the overall smile looks a lot more normal, the patient is less self-conscious and has more confidence, which is the goal of our outcome. Another example of a patient who had Botox along with selective neurolysis and facelift, and as you could see, this was her pre-op, and that's her post-op on the right with maximal smile with improvement and the number of teeth show symmetry, dimpling is better, banding is better. Patient asymmetric radiectomy. Give me a soft smile. And this Big is smile. her pre-op video. And now we're going to see her post-op video. Okay, give me a soft smile. And as give you can see, both the soft and big Big's smile nice. are far better. Okay, give me a strong smile. This is a lady who had bilateral facial paralysis, 
she could not smile. She had a frozen smile on both sides. We did a bilateral selective neurolysis with bradyectomy and Botox treatments around the eyes. And as you can see, she has an improvement. You can actually see her teeth before surgery. You can see her teeth. Soft smile. And these are her Big videos smile. before surgery Soft and smile. after surgery. Relax your face completely. Big smile. And as you can see, the corners of the mouth are moving really nicely, and the family know better. So that's how we can reduce that downward traction, thereby improving the upward traction. But for some patients, they still don't have enough power in that middle portion, the zygomatic. So in those patients, we have to augment that, that area, that zygomatic major muscle. The way we augment it typically is to utilize what's called a gracilis free flap, and this is basically a small muscle that we transfer from the inner thigh, and we utilize actually a nerve graft from the normal side of the face to help this move spontaneously. And this is that same patient who had synkinesis on the right side, which we saw, and he basically underwent a gracilis fob transfer, and as you could see, he has a much better upward traction and improvement. So I want to end this by... Uh, thanking everyone at the foundation for putting this together. Uh, I want to really thank uh, Lisa and Barbara. They've been just amazing. And uh, we'll take some questions now and uh, appreciate you, you know, coming on a Saturday and listening to this uh, presentation. Oh, thank you, Dr. Um so are we ready for the video, or would you like some questions first? I think, why don't we ask some questions, and then we can put the video. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Um, one of the questions are, how often, I guess you generally answer this, but how often can Botox be used, and how long does, does Botox generally last? Um, basically, Botox um, can be administered every three to four months and typically it lasts about that long. I generally, my philosophy is I'd like it to wear off in patients who are using it so I could see how they've evolved and how their facial nerve issues are rather than injecting them while they still have some activity. So I typically see my patients most of the time every four months so it usually requires about three times a year treatment and um, I've had patients who've been doing Botox for synkinesis for 10, 12 years, and they still have the same efficacy as 10, 12 years ago. There are um, newer botulinum products, neuromodulators, that are coming on the market. Recent studies have shown that they last maybe six to nine months. So as soon as those come on, we'll do some clinical trials and studies to see if they're going to be as effective as Botox for facial nerve disorders. Okay, um, another question is, would ingesting Botox around the eye to help with synkinesis interfere with my eye closure? If it's not done appropriately, potentially it can, but if it's positioned right and the dosing is correct, I have rarely, if ever, have seen in any of my patients someone who can close their eyes after Botox administration. Now, if it's done very aggressively or in the wrong position, and sometimes, unfortunately, certain things happen, it could potentially do that. But it's very rare. Okay, another question is, what is the best time to get Botox in the recovery process? For, so like maybe six months to a year? Or? You know, for a long time, and as you saw in my presentation, I was a advocate of waiting to see what happens. But we've moved more and more into doing intervention earlier. I would say probably six months would be the earliest that I'd like to do Botox uh, if the patient has severe synkinesis. Now, for the opposite side of the face, you could do it early to create some symmetry because patients don't want to walk around with complete, you know, asymmetry. But for the affected side, typically six to 12 months.
Sorry, are you there? Yeah. Um, next question. Sorry, we're muted. Um, what are the long-term effects of Botox use, and does it become less effective the longer you use it? It could, but I would say in the majority of my patients, it doesn't. If you don't do too many injections under three months, if you wait three to four months, you typically can have very, very similar response rates for years and years with the product. Now, there are a lot of people that go in for little touch-ups, this and that. We try to discourage that, but for the most part, patients can have it for a long time. There are a small percentage of patients that can develop resistance or antibodies to the protein, but again, if we do every three to four months, that rate is very, very low. Okay, another question. Um, how would you recommend someone go about finding a person to inject Botox in their area? Like, you see that many, you know, like our dentists or different people are offering Botox now, but do you have some general um, comments on how to select someone to do Botox? Um, I would say that probably the group, um, you know, facial plastic surgeons who have some experience in uh, head and neck surgery are probably going to be the individuals who are going to have the most experience with Botox and patients with facial nerve disorders. Unfortunately, you have to just seek and advice and talk to your to the doctors to see if they've had experience with it. And you know, if you're picking a very honest, reputable doctor and they don't feel comfortable, they'll tell you. So it's a tough, that's a tough question because around the country there just aren't that many people who are very, very experienced in this. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aziz, today. Um, that covers the majority of the questions we have at this time. Okay. So let me, I'm going to go ahead and get our video up. I'm going to ask you to do a few uh, facial movements so that we could demonstrate okay. uh, at least what I'm seeing with your synkinesis. Okay. So go ahead and raise your eyebrows. So as we could see, we could see the line, the forehead lines on the right side, but on the left side, the affected side, there's less movement and almost no forehead lines. Now there is tone here and there is a little bit of movement. Relax. Go ahead and now frown. So when Barbara is frowning, you see movement on the right side, some movement here, but not as much. Relax. Okay, go ahead and close your eyes. So when she's closing her eyes, open your eyes. I want you to pay attention to here. Close your eyes, open your eyes, close your eyes. You see actually the smile mechanism gets activated. So there is a cross connection between the eye closure and the muscle that gives you a smile. Go ahead and give me a soft smile. Perfect. Now a big smile with your teeth. So this is where you see the major discrepancy. You see the teeth show, you see the corner moving, but here the smile is kind of like frozen. There is a laugh line but the, we don't see that many teeth, both in the upper and lower part. The corner of the mouth moves up. Now, in the majority of people who have severe synkinesis, this corner actually moves down. So it looks like they're frowning rather than smiling. But in Barbara's case, we're very fortunate because it does move up. Now, I wanna, again, ask you to smile. Now you can see the left eye. You see the eye is much narrower than the right side. So that also occurs very commonly. Go ahead and smile again. You see dimpling here, and then you also see hyperactivity of this muscle, which is the platysma muscle. This muscle comes all the way up and goes right into that area. That's why this drags this corner down. So today for Botox, what we're gonna do is we are going to Botox around Barbara's eyes, to reduce that eye closure, we're gonna Botox the forehead, we're gonna Botox a little bit 
of this muscle, the corrugator, which is this frowning muscle. We are going to Botox the dimples. We're going to Botox the platysma and a little bit of this muscle that drags the corner down. And we're going to put a little drop here and here so that we reduce the teeth show so that there's a little bit more symmetry. So we're going to start actually on the unaffected side at this point. Big smile. So we want to make sure that the crow's feet are even on both sides. So the Botox is typically placed. This needle is a 32 gauge needle, so it's the smallest needle we can actually utilize. And it works very effectively. These little bumps will go away in about 30 minutes. Okay, so I want you to go like this. So we are going to relax this muscle. This is called the levator labii aliquai nasi. And that will help reduce this elevation of that teeth. And show me your teeth. So we're gonna now here reduce the activity of the depressor labii inferioris. Raise your forehead. We're gonna reduce the activity, relax, of this is called the frontalis muscle. Raise your forehead, relax. So we're done now with the right side. Okay, now on the left side, the affected side, we're gonna start at the corner of the eye. Big smile. Okay, relax. We have to position this a little bit differently than the other side, a little bit closer. So, smile, relax. Okay, next, big smile. You see the hyperactivity of the depressor anguli oris. I'm gonna go a little bit there. And we're gonna, big smile, the dimpling right here. Big smile. Now we're gonna... Now really try to get... Big smile. You see the muscles are extremely hyperactive. So this is um, obviously very different than doing a cosmetic type of Botox, but there are some areas that it's very similar. Uh, so we've uh, completed uh, our Botox uh, treatments. As you see, uh, the treatment actually takes uh, a very short period of time, about five to 10 minutes, but the planning is very, very, very important. So please make sure that if you are interested in getting Botox, that you utilize an injector, a physician that has experience with synkinesis because it's quite different than someone that just does cosmetic Botox. Please call the foundation if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Z, today. That was very informative. Do you have any concluding comments before we end the webinar today? No, if there are any other questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And again, I want to thank uh, you and Barbara for uh, all your involvement, and it's been wonderful working with you. Thank you, Dr. Aziz, today. This will end our formal presentation today. If you did have questions that were not answered, you can email us or please follow us on Facebook and Instagram also. This webinar recording will be available on our website in the near future. 
And please take time to answer the brief survey that will come up right as the webinar ends. We hope you will join us for our next webinar in early 2016. And thank you again for attending.